Um, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for having a Romance philologist uh, among you. Um, I will share my screen. And uh, because I cannot talk about Latin, uh, neo Latin texts, I will try to focus on the level of method. So we will, um, we will um, look at measures of distinctiveness for comparing text groups. Um, and although my examples, my example data will come from French literature, um, I think um, it will be possible to basically transfer this to, to Neo-Latin. And um, I think some of what I will say will connect to, to both of the earlier talks, especially to Machi's talk, um, who talked about uh, prose and uh, poetry uh, distinctions uh, and who actually used a measure of distinctiveness when he used the classifier and got the um, feature weights. Um, so we'll, we'll get, to, um, get to these points. And I do hope it is interesting for you. Now I'm speaking today um, on my own, but the project or the, the, um, the topic that I'm going to talk about is something that I've worked with um, with many people over the years and they're listed here. Uh, both a group of people in Würzburg uh, when I was still in Würzburg and so let's go back into the slides and I will skip right into it uh, and um, okay and we'll see okay let's hope for the best so um, I will quickly introduce the notion of distinctiveness with a, from a few different angles then I want to speak a little bit about one particular measure of um, distinctiveness that has um, been particularly important to me and also in computational literary studies um, in general uh, called Zeta. Uh, I will skip points three and four and will just to finish report a little bit on current work um, before I, I conclude. So what is meant by distinctiveness or keyness? So in linguistics, um, keyness would be the, the reference term um, and for some, for longer to explain reasons, I prefer distinctiveness. But so what do I mean by it? Now, first of all, um, why is it important? Um, and I think it is important because contrastive or comparative analysis so, is so widespread. It seems that it's almost a way of thinking for us in the humanities to compare things. Um, you know, in my field, it's very customary to compare realist authors with naturalist authors or uh, 21st century authors um, with late 20th, 20th century or to compare tragedies and comedies, et cetera. So we tend to compare and it gives, um, it gives um, our results more, yeah, color and um, it's better to, easier to understand um, uh, when you compare things because you have a reference in a way. So if it is so important, then once we move into the quantitative realm or the computational methods, obviously the methods that we use to, to do this kind of comparison become important as well. For that reason, there are plenty of measures of distinctiveness, um, at least a dozen different types, I would say. Um, and um, so I'm interested in, in the differences between them. Um, Again, because this is quite fundamental actually, especially in corpus linguistics and corpus stylistics, there are many tools that have implementations of keyness, me keyness measures or distinctiveness measures. For example, Antconc, WordCruncher, TXM, Stylo, Intelligent Archive, etc. cetera. They, um, many of them have uh, implementations. Most of them have uh, implemented one particular measure called log likelihood ratio. Uh, Stylo is an exception uh, to that. Uh, TXM is another exception, but that's the standard measure in computational uh, linguistics or corpus linguistics. And we'll see why this might be problematic. And I want to start with an intuition. And I show a map of Europe, not because of um, the colors or um, simply as a, as, a, as a visual aid. So my question completely independently of literature and all that is if we imagine uh, we want to find out what are the distinct uh, drinks in different European countries? Um, you know, what do people drink a lot? And if we, you know, take a stereotypical German example, we would think of beer. Yeah, Germans drink a lot of beer probably. Um, the, so it's typical for Germans to drink beer. Uh, 
but is it distinctive? And I would argue that it's not, because if you ask Belgians, uh, they have a very lively uh, um, and diverse beer culture. If you ask Britons or Irish or Polish, um, actually people in lots of countries like to drink beer. So beer is not distinctive of Germans, although it might be typical. And that's a key difference to understand. And now just for you again to memorize, so what is a distinct uh, drink for Germans? Uh, and I would actually argue that it's Apfelschorle. It's a mix of uh, mineral water, sparkling water with um, apple juice. And it's something that everybody in Germany drinks and you can buy it ready-made in bottles and that virtually nobody else ever drinks in any other country. Um, well, maybe maybe you will have some exceptions and you can you can tell me. But so Apfelschorle is a distinct drink um, for Germans, whereas beer is only typical. And distinctiveness is about Apfelschorle, not about beer. Now, let's talk about this a little bit more seriously. Um, so what are some conceptual properties of distinctive features? Um, and I would argue that you can, um, you can uh, distinguish different aspects. So they can be typical for a group, but that's not enough in a way. They should also be characteristic of the group and they should be, um, or they can in some cases express a, a certain aboutness um, of the group um, of texts that you're looking at. So show what, what, they, what these texts are really about. Um, they usually have some discriminatory power so you can use them to distinguish one group from another group. And that's why um, the um, feature weights can be uh, an interesting way of finding um, distinctive features. Um, if you found the distinctive, so words with, uh, or features with high distinctiveness for one group, and if you find them in the opposite group, you would, they would appear to be salient or surprising there. Uh, so they would they would jump out at you in a way. Um, so these are just some ways of approaching this problem of you know what is distinctiveness really conceptually. And there's actually very little research on this because uh, in computational linguistics people tend to jump directly into the statistic statistical definition of distinctiveness. They propose a measure, but if you don't distinguish the conceptual understanding of what you're aiming at from the measure, from the statistical or from the algorithm that implements your measure, then you have no uh, way of evaluating your measure because your measure by definition will produce the truth. Whereas if you have, and, and so any measure that you say is perfect will be perfect in a way, but if you distinguish between the conceptual level and the implementation, the algorithm, then you can start seeing how do the two relate? How do different measures perform with respect to a certain conceptual standard that you also need to implement obviously, but um, that's, that's, a, that's a different story. Now, based on this, we can think about um, what kind of, what different measures, uh, what kind of statistical properties or approaches uh, we can use. And um, I will skip this just quickly. Um, so what is distinctiveness statistically? So first of all, of course, it relies on the comparison of two groups, two groups of texts uh, in our case. Um, it calculates a score for each feature. So let's say if you do it on a lexical basis for each word, uh, if you do it on a, on, on a different level of different features, then those would be your features. So you can also calculate, of course, distinct, uh, distinctive um, topics or uh, distinctive stylistic features or whatever, you, whatever you're interested in. Uh, we have already seen that simple frequency is not enough because that would just be typical. And all of the function words, for example, would be frequent, um, but um, uh, not, um, not distinctive. Rather, um, you would have to look at comparatively high and low frequency, but even that is not enough. So there has to be a contrast, obviously. That's why we, we are interested in these words that have contrasting frequencies. But even frequency uh, this, um, differences are not enough. Um, you also need, uh, the last point here, sorry. Uh, you also need um, 
these features to be well distributed or well dispersed in your collection in order to be um, distinctive. To go back to this Apfelschorle example, Apfelschorle is distinctive, is a distinctive German drink because everybody in Germany drinks it. Not just the Bavarians, you know, not just the people in the north on the coast, but everybody. And so it's evenly, the, the, uh, the habit of drinking Apfelschorle is evenly distributed uh, uh, among the geographic space uh, of Germany. And that is another thing, another property that makes it um, a particularly distinctive um, um, uh, feature because it's representative of the group, not just of parts of the group. So that's why dispersion is another aspect um, of this. Now, the second last, second to last point is uh, that they don't need to be much mutually exclusive. So um, words can be distinctive without being existing only in one group and not at all in the other group. That would be like a, to take it to take the frequency approach to its extreme. Um, so that's not even necessary. It's a gradual. It's a, a yeah. It's a gradual phenomenon. Um, and I think now we can look at the the previous example here. Um, this is a log likelihood calculation made with Antkong comparing uh, 19th century uh, French novels to 20th century French novels. And what you see here are the uh, topmost uh, distinctive words uh, according to Antkong um, for the 19th century novels. And you can see uh, in the rightmost column that they are, they're all names, they're character names because each of them is pretty frequent in the corpus, but only because they have the, these names are very frequent in one novel each in a way. And for each of these names, I looked it up, you can, you can see that they are very frequent in one particular novel and virtually inexistent in all the others. Um, so they are not evenly distributed. And that's the main weakness of the log likelihood ratio um, that it is, it doesn't see the lack of even distribution. It only sees the frequency. And that's why I'm so surprised that log likelihood ratio is still the standard measure uh, in corpus linguistics um, because this is kind of an evident weakness and you would have to filter the names in order to get to the real uh, distinctive words that you might be interested in. So. Um, and that's why I, I, um, I like dispersion-based uh, measures because they do take this into account and they won't give you names um, unless they are uh, very frequent and very evenly distributed in your corpus. Anyways, so now we have a conceptual understanding and a statistical um, intuition um, of what distinctiveness measures are. And we can at least distinguish roughly uh, four types of such measures. So I just mentioned the log likelihood ratio. It's purely based on a, uh, on a comparison of frequencies. Basically, it's a fancy way of looking at relative frequencies in the two, of comparing the relative frequencies of features in two text groups. Um, then there are measures that are based on, uh, on distributions. Um, and this is, for example, the, what the t-test does. It's a little bit more subtle than pure frequency, but it's still not a very good uh, indicator of um, of distinctiveness um, because it doesn't it doesn't fully take into account dispersion, um, and the t-test, for example, is also very much uh, biased towards high frequency function words because they are statistically much more reliable and they yield lower p-values simply because they are so frequent. Um, and so, if that's what you want, if you're interested in distinctive function words, then the t-test might be good or some similar test like this, um, Wilcoxon test or something. Um, measures that are based on dispersion, and Zeta is an example of this, they give you a completely different, they have a different bias in a way. They have a different, uh, they have a bias towards medium frequency words. So com uh, content words. And that makes uh, Zeta results uh, so interpretable because we can interpret them, not just on a stylistic level, but really on the content level. So they are more rela uh, related to uh, to aboutness rather than um, um, style. And then we have uh, measures based on machine learning, um, like Machi mentioned. And for example, you could take the 
feature weights from a linear SVM a support vector machine classifier and then use them as distinctive or use this use these weights as an indicator of distinctive distinctive features. And again, there's um, here you have a bias in a way again towards uh, function words because they will be useful because they 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 will be present in all the texts um, because they are frequent um, and and you have a bias towards discriminatory words because that's the whole purpose of a classifier to discriminate between the groups and those words that are most discriminatory will be the ones that you get um, but not necessarily the ones that um, that you are most interested in in learning about the two text groups mainly so this is just for context now we know what distinctiveness is and what kinds of measures there are and now we can um, dive into zeta um, these are just two recommended readings. They are also listed on the slides and at the end of the um, slide, so you can find them again if you're interested in um, looking more closely into these different types of measures and how to um, how to evaluate them and the role of dispersion. Now let's look at zeta. Um, zeta is a measure of distinctiveness developed in computational literary studies by uh, John Burroughs. Um, it's based on the dispersion of features rather than pure frequency. It has a bias towards medium frequency content words, which makes it, uh, the results highly interpretable. And interestingly, it's ignored by virtually all relevant work in computational linguistics. Um, there's simply a, a rift between the communities. And one of, the, one of my aims with uh, uh, working on Zeta is to, uh, and on different measures, is to close that gap a little bit. Um, so John Burroughs proposed this uh, in the context of authorship attribution and stylometry. Um, there have been studies on it by Hugh Craig, for example, or by David Hoover, again, in the context of stylometry. There has, has been some uh, criticism of it uh, by um, Rizvi uh, in 2018. And we have worked on uh, Zeta as well. We have a Python implementation. We have done uh, an application study and an evaluation study. And now um, we have a project, um, uh, a dedicated project to Zeta and other measures of distinctiveness called Zeta and Company. Um, and I list some, um, some information here, but I will skip this. Uh, essentially, the key objective of this project is to model, implement, evaluate, and use, or use in application, various measures of keyness. Um, so basically continuing the work that I've been uh, talking about um, with really this idea that what we fundamentally want to do is build bridges between information retrieval, computational, uh, computational linguistics, and computational literary studies. Um, and um, give everyone an understanding of these biases of different measures so that they can make educated choices about which measure to use in which context and not to you know, think that one measure is the truth, but every measure has different properties and will give you different results. And what measure is right for you really depends on your interests. And it usually makes sense to use at least two measures, um, uh, two different kinds of measures to see you know, what different facets of your contrast um, they will bring uh, to the fore. Now, a little bit on Zeta. So you have two groups of documents, group one and group two. Um, each document in Zeta is split into segments. Uh, that's pretty important. That's where the information on the dispersion really comes into. Um, you then um, calculate the number, the, the proportion of segments from all the segments that a given word or a given feature is in, and that gives you the segment proportion. So if you have a certain word that uh, appears in almost all of the segments, because it is very well distributed, well, uh, pretty frequent, then you will have a high segment proportion. And if it only pops up in you know, one or two segments, then it will have a very low segment proportion. Um, the frequency of that word in that segment uh, doesn't play a role. So it's a binary frequency, binary frequent, uh, binary segment frequency. Uh, you only look at whether it appears or not, but not how many times it appears or not. So uh, spikes in frequency in one particular segment won't affect your results. And that's how, um, how, that's how you avoid um, uh, these uh, spiky words in a way like names uh, to interfere. Um, you calculate this for group one and for group two, and then um, there's simply a subtraction. You subtract the score for uh, of the word in group one from the score in group two, uh, the other way around, 
you do what you see on the screen, um, and that gives you the zeta score. Um, and then you can sort um, you can sort uh, your features by the zeta score, and at the extremes of your list, you will have the positive marker words and the negative marker words. So the words that are typical for the one group and the words that are typical for the other group. And we can simply have a quick look at some examples. And I'm, I apologize for the for the French um, for the French data. Um, this is comedies compared to tragedies, and I think it's quite obvious that the tragedies are on the top right, with blood, horror, throne, people, king, hate, crime, etc. Okay, um, and and you see those are highly interpretable uh, content words that we can immediately associate with tragedies. So this is a, I mean, this is a um, a benchmark corpus that um, that has very clear where we can expect very clear results, and we do get them. Um, and similarly uh, for the comedies, we have uh, words that are related to comedy. Although something that's interesting and tells us something about comedy um, here, not just content words like um, marriage or uh, affair are there, but also uh, words that are related to um, you know, spontaneous dialogue and interaction like cela and bon and uh, things like that. So the comedies and the tragedies seem to be defined on slightly different levels. And even though we have this, preferences, uh, this preference for content words, we have some of these function words or interaction words uh, in here as well. So this is the kind of result that you can get. Now, um, it's, uh, you can do all kinds of things with these kind of data. And one of the things you can do, and that's actually similar to what Machi showed earlier, is you can plot uh, each text in your collection by the percentage uh, of tragedy words and comedy words, uh, so the two groups. Um, and this basically gives you here the blue texts here, this corner. These are tragedies or dramas um, that have a very high proportion of tragedy marker words, 8%, and a very low proportion of comedy marker words. So those would be like the super typical, stereotypical probably, uh, tragedies. And up here uh, on the left top corner, you have um, comedies um, or plays with a very high proportion of comedy words and very low proportion of tragedy words. And you see, like in Maji's uh, visualization, that the two groups split um, pretty clearly. Uh, and you have to split here in the middle, but that there are some exceptions. And I will just look at two exceptions, the two most extreme exceptions. This one uh, is a tragedy. And it's in the area of the comedies. And it's interesting also in relation to what Machi said, because that's a prose tragedy. So that's exceptional. Obviously, tragedies have to be in the French 17th century. They have to be in verse, because kings cannot speak in prose. But here we have a prose tragedy. And it lands, in a way, uh, among the comedies. Um, another extreme case is this one. And the interesting part about this one is that this is a mislabeling in the data. So this is actually a tragic comedy. Um, and using this zeta analysis helped us actually detect this error in the metadata. And we fixed it for subsequent analysis. I just used the visualization here that has the error in it because it's actually interesting that you can uh, find errors in this way. And I wanted to, I didn't want to hide this in a way. But let's continue. Another use um, of this kind of data is as input features to a principal components analysis. Um, and what we have here is red, the comedies, blue, the tragedies, and green, the tragic comedies. And one of my research questions was, you know, are tragic comedies just a mix between comedy and tragedy? Or are they really a special type of comedy or maybe a special type of tragedy? And it turns out they are really a special type of tragedy. So they are very similar to the tragedies. There's a lot of overlap with the tragedies, or at least with a certain part of the tragedies, more precisely, uh, in the upper part. Um, and so they can really be described as a specific type uh, of tragedy. And it makes sense um, if, you, if you look at the poetics of the tragic comedy in, in the French tradition. Um, so this is another use. And final, um, final um, thing, just to, um, to explain, a little bit the, the mathematics um, of Zeta is this plot. It's a little bit of a complicated plot, 
But what it does is it shows you the document proportions um, of each word um, uh, for the uh, for the tragedies and the and the comedies, and the green words are those with high zeta scores, with extreme zeta scores. So either positive uh, for a tragedy or positive uh, for comedy, and um, it shows you that there's a certain. Um, it shows you why the medium frequency words are the zeta words, because the words here at the lo le lower left corner, those are the highly frequent uh, words, but they're they are frequent everywhere, so they don't get extreme uh, document proportions, and because they don't even have one extreme score, they cannot get a, uh, an extreme zeta score, and only words that have a certain um, that are present. Um, in a certain number of texts can have uh, a significant, you know, uh, zeta score, and those would be your medium frequency uh, content words. So this this behavior of zeta is built into um, into the into the study uh, into the measure. So it's not surprising. Now let's skip ahead. I will skip the variance. I will skip the application. Just a few quick words about current work, and then I will go uh, to conclude. So what we're doing at the moment is we're building a new benchmark corpus uh, of French contemporary novels that is currently at 400 novels for the 50s and 60s and 1,200 novels overall, and that will hopefully grow a little bit more. Um, and we're doing an exploration of dispersion-based measures because Zeta is not the only one. There are others as well. Um, um, for example, a, a base, uh, a, um, a dispersion-based measure that is based on a different measure of dispersion proposed by uh, uh, Stefan Gries. Uh, he proposed deviation of proportion as a measure of dispersion, and we're using that as a measure of distinctiveness. And now we compare those two, and we can see that depending on the settings, they correlate more or less perfectly with each other. And if we look at the results, we can also more or less, um, uh, you know, we can more or less, um, we can see that there are specific differences in how these two measures uh, behave. Um, and maybe if I if I take out just one example result here before finishing, is that we can see that there's an interaction between the two measures. On the left is the zeta measure, and on the right is the uh, the measure based on Gris dispersion uh, measure. Um, and we can see that if we segment our text into segments of 5,000 words, the difference between the two measures is not that big. They're not exactly the same words, but a lot of overlap and just a little bit of reordering in a way. But if we don't do any segmentation, then uh, in the, and that's the bottom half, if we use entire uh, novels, then we get very different results, uh, hardly any overlap. And we see that in this case, the Gris measure um, is more, um, comes up with more specific um, words that are probably more discriminatory, but maybe less typical of the genre. And that's the kind of differences, you know, that we're really after. And our goal is really to uh, to characterize uh, like um, around a dozen different measures with respect to these kinds of characteristics, statistically, conceptually, uh, and and possible use cases for them, and in relation to their parameters, of course. Okay, so I conclude, and I'm sorry for the for the slight rush here towards the end, um, but I don't want to um, go too much over time and uh, with this little break that we had in the beginning. So let's conclude. Um, in terms of the measures so far, we have gained a much more precise understanding of Zeta and also of some of the other measures. Um, we have um, understood that there's a certain relation between the segment proportions and Zeta. Um, I have called this a glass ceiling effect because uh, unless a word has a certain frequency, it cannot uh, have a, a high zeta score. So uh, um, rare words cannot have a high zeta score by definition or by uh, as defined by the algorithm. We have also developed in the past uh, a variant of zeta called log two zeta that has better performance than zeta in classification tasks. And we have explored this new dispersion-based measure uh, DPD. But there's lots more uh, to do, and we're middle, in the middle of the project, so I can't really, um, you know, make any specific recommendations at this point. Uh, we are really still in the middle of this. In terms of the application, uh, we have using these measures, we have gained some new insights into the relationship between tragedy comedy and tragic comedy, specifically putting the tragic comedy really in the tragedy uh, part uh, of the poetics in a way. Um, 
we have seen that there are differences between variants, uh, that they depend on segment length, that they can influence this like level of specificity on the one hand, but also the level of interpretability. Um, uh, so are they content words or function words? And based on this, the next step are really, for example, to focus on this issue of interpretability. How can we operationalize interpretability? How can we use it uh, to evaluate the measures and see whether there's a trade-off between, for example, classification performance on the one hand and interpretability? Is it really a trade-off or can we find a measure that is good on both fronts? Um, and of course, we're in the middle of this uh, systematic evaluation of Zeta and around a dozen similar measures. And with that, I thank you and I leave you with a few um, references. Thank you.